Any questions? So let's move on to the Northern Renaissance in Germany. So lecture guide number five. And let's talk about the context a little bit here. Remember, we always start with the context. So how is the context of Germany at the beginning of the 1500s different than what we've been seeing in Italy? And the big answer is that you have a shift in uh, the way that they practice religion. The big one that I want to push here, and it had been around in this part of the world for a very long time, that we have the rise of Protestant ideas. Now, they won't be officially announced. The break won't officially occur until 1517, right? But before this, Martin Luther is already preaching his ideas. A lot of people in the North are buying into the differences that they want to see put into place in Christianity. And the big difference, biggest difference of all of them is in Catholicism, there is a hierarchy between you and God. It's set up that way. Catholics had it, and this might not be your Catholicism, right? So don't take this personally if what I'm saying is like, well, that's not the way I practice. At this time, the way they had it set up is there's God, Holy Spirit, Jesus, all the elect, Virgin Mary, those are way above you. And then there's people on earth like the Pope, the Cardinals, the Bishops, the Priest, way above you. And you're somehow going to get to God through those intermediaries including artists, by the way. Remember, we threw them in there. But the point is, your pathway to God is through specialists, people that are better at this than you, people who know more than you, people that, frankly, are considered to be naturally more religious than you, more spiritual than you. When you go to the north, however, Protestantism pushed the idea that your pathway to God should be directly through the Word of God. That was fundamental. First thing was through the Bible. The Word of God is your pathway to God. You don't need intermediaries except for them to help you understand that Word of God. By the way, this is also the time, you know, immediately before the Protestant Reformation, the printing press was developed or rather the movable type printing press is in the works, so that you can start actually translating, which will occur in the 15th, 16th, late 15th, but especially through the 16th century, the Bible into local dialects, into German instead of Latin or Greek or Hebrew, into English, St. James Bible later on, but the Anglican Church immediately started their own Bible, and actually have people read it. It's not just through the Word of God, though. It's also through something known as the imitatio Christi. The imitation of Christ, literally, is what that means. And this is a really complex, very mystical idea, but we're just going to dumb it down here a bit. It's like saying, what would Jesus do? If I want to be more religious, if I want to be more Christian, I have to ask myself, how can I be more like Jesus? What would he do? Both of these uh, approaches emphasize the idea that humans have the capacity to understand God on their own. Both of them emphasize the idea that Christ is human and that by associating or empathizing with him, you have a pathway to God. In other words, they push a more kind of human type of Christ rather than this elevated God on earth form of Christ that you get more from Christians. Another big thing, though, that happens in the North, and this gets tricky and we don't see it as much in our art, is that they have a lot of iconoclasm. And you will have read about this. Martin Luther actually stood up and said, don't do that. Don't ruin works of art. There are only certain things that are forbidden by the Bible, representations of God himself, for instance, but everything else is appropriate. But people are running through churches, grabbing sculptures, burning paintings, and so forth, thinking that they violated various parts of the Bible, including creating false idols, creating graven images, and so forth. Those are the big things I want you to know. Now onto the stylistics. What do you expect to see visually in works of art in the North? Well, one of the big ones is, right off the bat, they have less interest in idealism and more generally interest in naturalism. Things that look like believable bodies but are not based upon a realistic other human being. I'm not saying they don't use idealism, they're just less interested in it than what you'd find in the South. 
you tend to get a lot more symbolism in the north. And from the north, I mean Germany up through the Netherlands than you do in Italy. In fact, in a lot of cases, symbols are everywhere in these works of art. We're actually coming in a little bit later where it starts to get toned down, but it's certainly a part of their tradition. Number three, unlike the Italian Renaissance where you see works that are very, very unified, meaning nothing added, nothing subtracted, you get very cluttered by the standards of Italian uh, standards, compositions, meaning lots of stuff going on, lots of busy stuff, lots of details in particular of things that you wouldn't get in the, the Renaissance itself. And another big one is you'll oftentimes in the Northern tradition get religious subjects set in a contemporary setting or some nod to your own everyday world. So for instance, you might see every once in a while an annunciation scene, but it's taking place in a contemporary house rather than some ancient house out there. What you're looking at on the screen here is the Eisenheim altarpiece when it is uh, in its closed state, meaning altarpieces, which are works of art that are created to sit in front of an altar and be an object of devotion, something to contemplate while you're listening to the words of the sermon and so forth, actually come in multiple different types. This one in its closed state is what we call a triptych, meaning it has a three panel exterior. Triptych for tri, but it actually is, once you open it up, what's called a polyptych, a multi-panel painting, because it opens right here down the center, and you'll see additional painting scenes, both on the verso side, the other side of this, as well as in the center scene. And these things get closed and open based upon what's going on, what types of uh, you know, sermons are being said, what day of the week it is, and so forth. And if you've done the reading, you know that this one actually opens a third time and there's a huge sculpture behind the whole thing, which we're not going into. So this is Matthias Grunewald's Eisenheim altarpiece. In the center, which is where we want to start, we have a crucifixion scene. And this is unlike crucifixions you've seen before, right? So how is this different, for instance, than some of the crucifixions you saw on the first day? What is being emphasized here? Okay, it lo he looks like someone who's really undergone some heavy shit, doesn't it? I mean, this does not look like a graceful, beautiful, weightless body. This looks like a body that's been beaten and broken, nailed to a cross, right? Undergone incredible agony. Does everyone see how this ties to the context? If we're in a an area that's going towards Protestantism that pushes the idea that Christ was human and that one of the big things you can do to understand Christ is to empathize or understand him through the imitatio Christi, then it would make sense that you would see more representations of Christ undergoing a very human, very painful death. And how does that change the way we think about the crucifixion? If we're moving towards, let's say, a thesis about these types of works, and by the way, I'm going to go through a more systematic analysis of this in a moment, you can start thinking along the lines of, well, in the Italian Renaissance where they, they idealize these figures, they're tending to think of them as better than us, they're idealizing so as to glorify, you're not meant to think of them as human. And then we get here and we say, no, we want you to think of his sacrifice as very human so you understand what a sacrifice it really was, that he was willing to do this for you. His love for humanity leads him to this place where he's willing to undergo this horrible, painful death for you. Now let's go through and see all the ways that's uh, are emphasized here, starting with the body itself. The body itself is made a bit bigger than it really should be. He sacrificed legitimate, realistic scale so as to give you all the details of that broken, battered body. All the way through this, there are things that we can associate with a body that's broken that you don't need an art historian for, and you can just say, you know, no one's shoulders should probably do that. Having nails nailed through your hands and feet that emphasize the twisted agony, not good. Anyone's skin who looks like that, not good. But the other thing that they do here to emphasize all of this is look at how every line just changes direction drastically that everything's short little choppy lines. Those jagged lines take a lot of work for your eye to see. Your eye's gonna be moved around a lot on them. 
they tend to be things that are going to, again, be em creating emotion for you rather than long, sweeping S-curves. How about the lighting itself? This is very dramatic lighting, isn't it? Very strong contrast between light and dark. That's another thing that emphasizes your emotional response to things. It's why we use them in stage sets all the time. A sharp juxtaposition of light and dark is something that will, again, add energy and emotion to a work of art. All the jagged lines, again, brought up on this, you know, pretty bad loincloth here as well. He's like us in that he's dying this horrible death, and everything pushes him down towards the earth. Even the transept, the crossing member of the cross, bends and brings him down here. He's down here amidst these other human beings, not way up above them, is he? And then we work our way around it. On this side, look at the associative effects these are going to have on us. Virgin Mary faints, all in white. John the Evangelist crying, holding her up. Mary Magdalene with her long hair lying on, or kneeling on the ground, you know, praying. By the way, you're always going to know Mary Magdalene near the feet again. Jar of ointment down here, an alabaster jar associated with her uh, salving the feet of Christ and so forth. Over on this side, who's that? John the Baptist. Lots of hair, again, you know, ascetic figure. Uh, what's the problem with John the Baptist being at this scene? For those of you who are, you know, know your Christianity inside and out and the way back? He's already dead. He's already, dead. He's already been sacrificed. Salome's dance, the dance of the seven veils, he's been beheaded. So if you think of one side of this being the people who are actually there, and the other side being symbolic, in which you've got a lamb wandering around with a crucifix over its shoulder, bleeding into a chalice, you'd be right, right? This is a dead giveaway. Symbolism. Not very rational by Italian Renaissance standards to have lambs running around with crucifixes, but it is symbolic of what? Sacrifice, number one, right? The, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. How many people had lamb yesterday for Easter? That's where that goes to. Bleeding into a chalice. That chalice is the Holy Grail. What is that symbolic of? The Holy Communion. Remember that? We're at the Last Supper. Christ turns the wine into his blood. There it is again. So his sacrifice and hear what John's saying literally. It's written out here as, as he increases, I decrease. Which I know is weird, but what it's meant to say is that John the Baptist was the last of the major characters born before the time of Christ. He oftentimes in Christianity gets associated with the Old Testament. And what this is saying is that prophecies or characters in the Old Testament which are just there, again, this is according to Christians, in order to foretell the coming of Christ, decrease in importance as Christianity rises in importance. Right? Tons and tons of naturalistic, gruesome detail to go with this. Now let's add one more big thing to the context. And we could do this with just about every work if we had the knowledge. This context for this work isn't just the rise of Protestant ideas. The church for which this was made, which is out in Colmar, kind of right on the border with uh, France, and it was a Catholic church, it was just influenced by rising kind of Protestant ideas, actually it ministered to people who were dying of skin ailments. And those skin ailments were horrible things. It's not like, oh, I've got dry skin. They had things like leprosy, or something known as St. Anthony's fire, which was something called by an er, uh, caused by an ergotism, a bacteria primarily on rye grains, that basically created a flesh-eating disease. And it came with it, horrible hallucinations, incredible pain, and I bet you most of you know these are not curable things. These people are going to die. So when I mean a hospice, it's gather all these people together, try to administer it to them the best they can, knowing that they're not going to make it. Now, it might seem like a bitter pill to have them looking at this kind of body that mimicked their own body lesions and problems with their own skin and being told, hey, don't worry about it, right? But that's how this thing seems to have operated. We go back here again. You probably notice these characters on the outer leaves. These are 
St. Sebastian and St. Anthony. St. Sebastian, who was martyred by being shot full of arrows, was associated with leprosy. Write it down, you're going to forget it. St. Sebastian, associated with leprosy, that's why he's here. This is St. Anthony. St. Anthony was a saint who was an ascetic as well, went off into the wilderness, was tormented by demons, had gross hallucinations, uh, and that's why he's associated with St. Anthony's fire, this other major skin-eating disease. So they're in there on purpose. Now the other part of this is, the only way to keep people alive when they have something like a flesh-eating disease or they have leprosy is through amputations, and some interpreters have pointed out that when you open this work of art, it actually amputates part of Jesus' arm off. And when you open up the bottom, this is what's known as a predella. I don't care if you remember it. It's an entombment scene. It actually amputates his lower legs off. So that the work may be very closely keyed into one group of people who would have seen these, people dying of these horrible skin diseases. The final thing is, why? Why would you show them this? And the answer is pretty straightforward. We know this. There's been a millions and millions of dollars thrown at the idea of faith-based healing and zero evidence at all that one's, let's say, faith can heal someone. But what we have figured out is that someone's faith, regardless of what that faith is in, can absolutely alleviate pain. Absolutely. Meditation, better than opioids. Maybe not as fun, but definitely better for you, right? We know that. So what if you brought people in front of this and you said something to them like, listen, you're dying this horrible disease. Honestly, there's no way to save you. But there's a silver lining in all of this, which is if you remain faithful and you practice the imitatio Christi, which, by the way, you can do better than most because you understand firsthand the pain that Christ went through. You can empathize with him. You can get it. And if you remain faithful through all of this, a better day awaits for you. This is the opening uh, of this, and I'm not going to, we don't have time uh, this quarter to go through all of it, but you've got an enunciation over here. You've got a kind of nativity scene, which, by the way, is typically German. It's very natural. You even have a bed, a birthing bed, and a chamber pot, and a cleansing bath, and so forth. If you remain faithful to the cause, this is the last scene in the entire altarpiece. It's a resurrection scene. And in this resurrection scene, notice how Christ, just moments before, with all of that battered, bruised body, rises weightless with no flaws on that body. That awaits for you, it says. And this might have really been fairly effective in letting these people feel like there was something better for them waiting, right? That this could ameliorate their pain. The most important artist in Germany at this time, I think without question, was Albrecht Dürer. It was a very early portrait by Albrecht Dürer. He did a number of these. Um, this is the portrait, by the way, that he did to send it to his future wife. He grew up in a family um, of 18 children, I know, 18 children, in Nuremberg, which was the kind of the, the you know, crowning glory of Germany at this time period. His family had a lot to do with artistry, many of them working in uh, goldsmithing and other things that take meticulous little... Uh, detailed work, and he was an incredibly gifted and quite ambitious painter. When he painted this, he painted it for his future wife and her family. Uh, it was an arranged marriage, as was you know, proper for the times, and he's wanting to show a number of things here. First of all, he's wanting to show you what he looks like. He's wanting to show you his skill, because he painted it himself, and it's extraordinary. And in his hands, he actually holds a symbol of marriage. It's a sprig of oryngium, which is a term on your handout. Oryngium is a little herb that's a, thought to be an aphrodisiac. So it's a little gentle nod towards marriage and love and sex and so forth. Which, by the way, I hadn't said this before, but some of you know this. In Catholicism, sex is really carefully circumscribed by the need for procreation. And Catholics would say at this time that the only reason you're supposed to be having sex is to procreate. 
right? That's still the, the way that Catholics talk about it today, and I presume that even today, like way back then, most Catholics probably didn't follow the church dogma, but that was the official stance on this. Protestants don't think that way. Protestants think that sex in marriage and the pleasures that come from it are completely appropriate whether or not you're trying to procreate or not. And Martin Luther even said this a lot of time, which, by the way, led to a ton of backlash, a ton of people being like, oh, that's not appropriate and so forth. But you should be aware that another thing you might add to what you see in the North a lot more than the South is playful sexual innuendo in works of art, right? They're not quite as buttoned up as you find in the South. On the back of this, by the way, Albrecht Durer, never at want for his own uh, ambition, actually wrote, my affairs will go as it is written in the stars. In 1500, he painted this portrait of himself. And if you've seen this before and you thought you were looking at Jesus, that's kind of on purpose. It's quite iconic, right? He looks right back out at you. His hand closing his cloak is like this, but if he did this, it'd look like he was giving you that gesture of the blessing or benediction here. He's doing it on purpose because, first of all, he wants you to think about that imitatio Christi. It's a very humanist idea at heart. He's saying something like, you want to be like Christ because Christ is the best of all things, and as a humanist, we all want to be the best that we can be. He actually said in the, the little reading I gave you, part of those Jansen readings, right? Um, knowing more makes you resemble the likeness of Christ who truly knows all things, right? So trying to know more, be better at what you do, is something that makes you Christ-like, even if you can't get there. By the way, for just for your own good, when you're doing slide ID exams, this little symbol here, the big A over a D, is a sure way you know you're looking at an Albrecht door, and he actually dates all his works, too. He did a ton of paintings, but he also did a lot of prints. Prints were a way to make more money and distribute his works more widely. This is a woodblock print, one of a series of woodblock prints done on the subject of the book of Revelation that became very popular around 1500 because everyone thought that the world was going to end there. So people were worried about this. They're reading the book of Revelation, which is, of course, end of days, last judgment type symbolism. Uh, and he, he decided to cash in on this in a way. He would create these prints of scenes from the book of Revelation, and then on the other side of many of these, there would actually be the passages from the book of Revelation that these refer to. And I'm sure you've heard the book of Revelation before, but these are scenes that, for instance, the, the verbiage you'd be aware of, even if you're not Christian, from like horror movies that quote these all the time. So let me give you this passage. This is the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, come. I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say come and then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given a power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked, and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider named Death, and Hades was following close behind him. They were given a power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. What's so amazing about these types of things uh, is that everywhere you're looking at that you see a little bit of black, that is the last little vestige of a piece of wood where everything that is white has been carved away. The cool thing about this, of course, is that you can print multiples of these. You can produce, once you've got that plate, in this case a wood block, many of these and distribute them widely to probably people who couldn't afford 
certainly a big oil painting, and you can corner another kind of market. It becomes a, oftentimes a little bit more populous way to produce these things. They're extraordinarily um, difficult to create. He absolutely would have had technicians helping him out with these and with his engraving. So you just go through this and you see this is end of days. This is last judgment. Here come the, the characters that are there to kill off the rest of the living creatures so that everyone can be judged, these four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is the one I really want you to remember inside and out. This is an engraving. And again, um, you know, if you ever get the chance to take a print class, take it. They're so fun. Um, but everything you're looking at here is the opposite of what I was just saying in that it's an intaglio print. Everything that you see that's black here is created by little scratches, oftentimes running parallel and cross-checked uh, or cross-hatched. Um, that would hold ink, and then when you press this, the paper actually gets pushed into those little cracks and pulls the ink out to create these. It's, it, the technical virtuosity of this is beyond measure. It's unbelievable to be able to do this. All of this, if you're working with a pencil, is hard enough, but to do that with little tiny scratches of different depths and different thicknesses is amazing. And of course, this is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's a work that the context for me is key. He painted, or I'm sorry, he created this in 1504. It actually says it here in this little plaque that's known as a cartolino. And a cartolino is something that had been used before but hadn't been revitalized until about Albrecht Dürer doing it. It's a little fictitious kind of trompe l'oeil like sign hanging on something, sometimes little scrolls. Then in this case, he could say Albrecht Dürer made this here, right, in Nuremberg, by the way. Albrecht Dürer made this Nuremberg, 1504. And the reason that's important is he created this before his second trip to Italy. And the Italians forever have been basically saying, you northern artists, you stink. You're no good. You understand how to create likenesses of things. You're very good at that naturalistic detail. But remember what they said about naturalistic detail. What did Plato say about naturalistic detail? Mimetic works of art. They're no good because they're imperfect imper copies of something that's already an imperfect copy. And Albrecht Dürer decided he would create this work and then send it to Italy, by the way, all over Europe, so that everyone would see this before he showed up. And the trick with this is, the main part is this figure here of Adam is the world's best canon and proportion figure. He has measured this out. He's structured it perfectly. All the principles that the Italian artists held dear He's showing you he knows how to do it, absolutely knows how to do it, based upon classical works of art and so forth. And then he fills the rest of the work up with all of these symbols everywhere, totally typical profusion of symbols, lots of naturalistic details. In other words, very, very German, very, very Northern Renaissance stylistics to say, I can do what you guys can do. I can also do this other thing that you can't do very well. He's basically doing this to kind of show off to the Italians. So let's go through what we're looking at here. You help me out. You will have done your reading here. We've got Adam. He's obviously a perfect canon proportions. He is standing next to this. What is that? What kind of bird is that? Parrot. Parrot. What do parrots do that's really cool? They talk. What do they talk, though? What do they say? They only, they only repeat what you say to them. They mimic. That's his little joke to the Italians. You say we can only mimic, right? And he puts it right near the Cardellino that says Albrecht Dürer made this in Nuremberg in 1504. And then, of course, right there next to this is this thing that is a perfect canon of proportions. We don't just mimic. We know how to do this idealism just like you. We just choose not to, he's saying. Now, of course, Eve is the one who's directly taking the fruit from, again, the snake. Again, it's some kind of fig, pro probably. Why is Adam reaching down here? The fruit's up here, buddy. What's the innuendo there? It's sex again, right? That this gets interpreted as a sexual transgression. That's absolutely supposed to be in here. How about Eve's body? Does that look like a perfect canon of proportions? 
It's hard to tell, isn't it? It is. It's actually based upon male canons and proportions. It just looks a little odd because, as I said before, there weren't canons and proportions in classical times for the female body. They tend to be more sensual. So then, let's go around this. What is in this picture that might be a symbol, and what would it be a symbol of? So you see the snake, the serpent, symbol of the devil. How about this, the mouse? What are rodent symbols of? Mice, rats. Yep. Disease, devil, something evil, right? And all that disease and evil gets unleashed when Adam's lifting his foot to reach for something he's not supposed to be reaching for, and his foot comes off the tail of that rat that unleashes it. Over here, there's a cat, a rabbit, an ox, and an elk here. If you've ever seen like a spoof of medieval medicine, you might have come across these characters before. They're symbols of what were known as the four humors. Four humors is a very medieval idea. Monty Python spoofs this all the time. It was said that the body was made up of different fluids that controlled various kinds of aspects of human being, that when they were in balance, as they were before the fall, were all fine, but when they get out of balance, will lead people towards different kinds of characteristics. So again, I believe this is in your text, but follow along with me. The um, elk here is associated with melancholy, meaning a kind of brooding state. It's very creative, but it's also something that's depressive, and it's caused by an excess of black bile in the liver. I don't care if you remember the bodily fluids. It's all kind of hokey anyway. Over here is the ox. The ox is associated with lethargy, right? Lack of energy. And the excess bodily fluid that you have here is phlegm. Easy enough to remember. If you've had a cold, you probably don't have a lot of energy here. In the foreground here is a cat, the choleric cat, which is, if you know cats, exactly spot on. A little bit too arrogant, a little bit kind of aggressive, caused by yellow bile. And then behind that, the rabbit. The rabbit's associated with excess sexual drive, horniness. It's caused by excess, it's called the sanguine uh, element, excess blood. In any case, these things all get out of whack, supposedly. They're nice little symbols that are caused by the fall of Adam and Eve. The last little symbol I want to add in here, and you've noticed how much incredible detail is in this. No way an Italian Renaissance artist does this. It's very, very busy, lots of great detail is up here in the far corner, there's a mountain goat standing on the edge of a precipice out looking out over it. And people have wondered about what this means all the time. Have you ever seen what goats can climb? And the answer is anything they want to climb, basically. I remember being on a trip in Crete at one time, and we were going by this 50-foot cliff, and there had to be 40 goats standing on what looked like nothing, as if someone just took glue and like pasted them to the side of this thing. They can go up anything, and what this is meant to be symbolic of is the idea that facing you at every turn, very, very Protestant idea, very, very Martin Luther idea, is evil, are temptations. You need to be sure-footed in the face of all these treacherous situations. Does anyone have any questions? All right, I'll see you on Wednesday. We'll continue on. We're a little bit behind now. We'll continue on with the Northern Renaissance.
We left off last time looking at the Northern Renaissance. So the Renaissance as it takes place in the areas that today are Germany all the way up through the Netherlands. And as I said before, we have a shift here, uh, both in the context a little bit, things that are more um, applicable to this part of the world, such as the rise of the Protestant Reformation is one of the biggest ones, the, the rise of uh, the printing press and translating of the Bible into local dialects that happens during this time. Uh, and also, of course, a shift in the style, what we expect to find in these works of art. So again, very quickly, going over this, remember that one of the big things that differentiates the Italian Renaissance from the Northern Renaissance is their interest in classicism. Up north it's far less apparent. And so while I showed you in the last work that Albrecht Dürer, being very aware that the Italians are thinking you guys aren't very good artists because you don't know anything about the classical tradition, you can only mimic what you see and you do it very well but that's not what art's all about, creates a work, Adam and Eve, in order to kind of rebut that argument. However, the vast majority of these artists really just don't care that much about Greek and Roman art forms, or at least they don't care to the same degree as the Italians do, and it kind of makes sense. The Italians' history, their heritage goes back to Rome, that goes back to Greece, you know, kind of makes sense. So then what we start to see in these works of art are, remember, we've got uh, a big interest in making things kind of relatable. They either make, as we saw in Grunewald's work, Christ look more human, act more human, um, be more uh, something that you can empathize with. And they'll do that in a lot of works, and that even goes back to much earlier works than we've looked at here. That may have something, it certainly has something to do with the Protestant Reformation and their push for the idea of the imitatio Christi even more, the idea that your direct pathway to God is through the Bible and through kind of trying to understand uh, these biblical characters as human beings. The other stylistics are things like very, very high detail, much more detail than you get in the Italian Renaissance and a profusion of detail, not just on bodies, but in the background of things, you know, really trying to show you descriptively everything in that world. Lots of symbolism in the North as well, right? Lots of symbolism in these works of art, lots of kind of cluttered compositions, a much higher degree of naturalism rather than idealism. Figures look like more like real human beings and so forth. So we're in the midst of Durer and I said, there's a moment in time in which Durer, a very ambitious artist, realizes that prints are not only a bit more lucrative than paintings, which he continues to do, by the way, uh, but they're also something that can uh, tap a market <coughs> that otherwise paintings can't, a little bit, let's say, cheaper market. And prints, of course, can be widely disseminated, which for an artist who is very concerned with getting his name out there and being recognized all over Europe is a good thing to do. Um, before this time, artists and basically artists kind of collectors would travel around Europe and they'd see things and they'd copy things and that's really the way that things got distributed. Someone would go around, really, they, uh, rich collectors would have artists who went around and actually copied other works of art and brought them back to them to show them what was out there. And that's the way that things oftentimes got distributed and now you've got these prints um, this is one from a, a series of his master prints, as they're called, a little bit later than the Adam and Eve. This is Night, Death, and the Devil. Devil. Remember, these are um, uh, engravings, so everything that you're looking at here that's a black mark is caused by a little scratch in the surface of a metal plate that then's transferred to a piece of paper, and you can do this over and over again. I, I just revel at these. I'm just amazed by how much work goes into these. But of course, once you put the work into the plate, you can create multiple copies of this. What you're looking at is the active Christian life. Christians tended to kind of separate Christian life into two components, active and passive. Active are people like knights, soldiers, people going out there and working, um, you know, uh, to to push the ideas of Christianity, but frankly also to conquer other areas seen as pagan. And we see the knight here uh, who, you know, is striding on his horse, very kind of heroic symbolism going all the way back to equestrian monuments in Rome. 
who is being, I suppose, teased or threatened by uh, death here, who holds in his hand an hourglass saying, hey, you're going to die, right? Which is true for all mortals. And then the devil behind him, and yet he just looks straightforward. He doesn't worry about this at all. Along with his trusted hound, they're just off to do their business. They're not going to be uh, thrown off course by the, the, you know, this threat. With that being said, I mean, just look at this work. It's partially about that, but it's really about the beauty of the representation of the horse itself, all of this detail that's in the background. You know, that's why you're buying these things. The contemplative Christian life is really represented here. This is St. Jerome in his study. St. Jerome is best known for creating the Vulgate. The Vulgate is the translation of the Bible into Latin. And you can always tell you're looking at St. Jerome because his animal familiar will be a lion in the foreground. And he'll usually be at his desk translating that Bible. So there you see him, hard at work. His halo is a little kind of glowing nimbus uh, over his head. This is the contemplative or the kind of scholarly Christian life. This is what priests are like. This is what monks are like. This is a different... Um, vocation in relation to Christianity, not going out there uh, and actively doing something in the sense of a soldier, but doing something that's more about scholarship. The other thing that you see a lot with St. Jerome, and I'm sure you've seen these over and again, are those skulls that are in this. That's always going to be a symbol or a reminder of death. It's just meant to say, you know, you're, it's called a memento mori, reminder of death you're going to die one day, and so be thinking about that in the course of your life uh, so that when the last judgment comes around, you'll be you know, elevated into heaven. The addition to the kind of two-part scheme when it comes to the standard ways that Christian life is represented, either, either active or passive, is that um, Durer adds into this melancholia, or the artistic contribution to life. Melancholia here uh, references the idea that artists are prone to this, this condition known as melancholia that I referenced last time when we were looking at Adam and Eve, the elk represented melancholia. Remember that, that idea of the four humors, black bile and the liver, or whatever the heck that rationale was. Uh, in any case, melancholia is a rather depressive state on the one hand, but it's a very creative state. And so the, the idea was that artists were people, kind of semi-geniuses, born under the sign of Saturn, they used to say, who were prone to depression and contemplation and brooding and so forth, but in so kind of being that way, were more creative than other human beings. And what you're witnessing here is the kind of melancholic artist who is, I would say, kind of stuck in a way. This is a male, by the way. This is a, even though with the long hair, think of Albrecht Durer, stuck, kind of contemplating, thinking, creating, has implements of measurement and creation all around them. So things like scales and hourglasses and a compass in their hand and saws and so forth. These are all associated with measuring and uh, ordering and so forth, but isn't doing anything, right? And it's juxtaposed against this child who isn't um, encumbered by having to contemplate and get it right in advance and really kind of think things out and will just do, do, do without thinking at all. So this is set up, in other words, as a distinction or a juxtaposition to say, this is how this works. The contemplative life can also lead you to artistry, which is prone to being kind of stuck at times. Uh, a good example of this is, for those of you who are, um, let's say, fairly compulsive or perfectionist, if you've ever sat down to do something, write a paper, and you're like, ah, oh, I just want to get this right, and you keep stopping and rewriting a sentence over and over again, that's what they're referring to with the artist. Now, also in here are little things that are symbols of artistry. The polyhydrin over here. I'm not going to take you through the deep history of this. Um, and the magic square down here, where if you add up the numbers in any order, they always add up to the same number and so forth. These are all just little references to artistry. Final painting I wanted to show you by Albrecht Durer is this. 
It's usually referred to as the four apostles, but unfortunately they're not even apostles, uh, or at least not all of them are apostles. Uh, but the title is stuck. Um, it was probably originally, it's a very big work, very, very big, uh, you know, almost life-size work. It was probably originally intended to be an altarpiece in which these two panels would have been the outer leaves and there would have been a central panel, but for whatever reason, and it's not uncommon, that center panel never got created and he instead composes, as you see it here, as two panels um, kind of of these figures looking at each other. It's very closely aligned with Protestant ideas in the sense that the figures that are in the foreground are associated with Martin Luther in particular. And we do know that Albert Durer had Martin Luther's sermons, copies of these, in his own possession at a time where that was an offense that could have been punishable by excommunication and even death. And these sermons were the sermons that he was giving before he was actually Martin Luther excommunicated and nailed his theses to the wall. In any case, what I'm getting at here is in the foreground here, is um, this is John the Evangelist, and John the Evangelist was, without question, Martin Luther's favorite uh, of the apostles. He is an actual apostle because he was the closest to Christ. He was the most like Christ. And remember that Martin Luther really pushed this idea of the imitatio Christi that I simplified down to say, People trying to empathize or relate to Christ by saying, I want to be like Christ, and if I'm like Christ, I will be a better person. If I can put myself in his place, do all the things that he did, try my best to be like him, that's one of the pathways to grace or to understanding Christian ideals. Um, so there he is in the foreground, and notice who's in the background here. Who is that? This is the... I was going to say this is the key, but that's the giveaway. It is literally the key, right? Who's got the key? St. Peter. Saint Peter, very good. And St. Peter then is given the key by whom? Jesus himself, who says, Upon this rock build my church, which leads to the founding of St. Peter's in Rome. And St. Peter becomes the first bishop of Rome or the first pope which is a long way around saying that Catholics believe that their power comes directly from Christ. He said, hey, Peter, here you go, establish the Catholic Church. Therefore, their legitimacy is based upon that story. By pushing Peter into the background, he's not saying Peter's not an important person. Obviously, he's included him, but he's putting him behind the figure that he associates more highly with Christian values and more closely with Protestant values. On the other side, this is St. Paul, and St. Paul's epistles were incredibly popular in Protestantism, pushing again ideas of a more direct, uh, kind of emotional relationship with religion. And he is given priority over Mark, who is in the background, who again is associated with Catholicism. Mark is actually associated in particular with translating Peter's uh, gospels and so forth. So in any case, what I'm trying to say very simply is the figures that are giving priority here are closely associated with Martin Luther and Protestantism, while the other figures who are pushed in the background are associated with Catholicism, showing you where Durer, the artist's ideas or preferences stand. And then down below, some of you in the front can probably see this, there's writing down here. These are primarily passages from the Bible. They're very particularly chosen. They say things like, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and all of that, saying, hey, Protestants believe your pathway to who God is through the Bible. Other passages that have been lifted from the Bible say things like, beware of false prophets, and so forth. And you can tell that they're pointing towards those Catholics who are leading people astray, they believe. So then just briefly, because we have one of these in the Seattle Art Museum, this is Lucas Cronach the Elder. And I've kind of shortened down your lecture guide to just show a few, um, few things here that, there. in other words, there are a couple of things that were on your lecture guide that I'm not going to be showing to keep up with the class here. This is the Judgment of Paris, where I left off last time when I was talking about Aphrodite and why she is... Um, why part of her iconography is that golden apple. 
What happens is that, of course, Zeus says, I'm not going to make this judgment, sends it down to Paris, who is the young prince of Troy. And that's kind of what you're witnessing here. It's a particular interpretation of this. But the way the story goes is that Hermes, who is the messenger god, who is also known as Mercury by the Romans, uh, is always the one who shows up to tell someone what God's bidding is. And he shows up and he wakes Paris up and he says, hey, Zeus has a job for you. It's a pretty good job if you're a heterosexual male, by the way, which is you get to judge who the most beautiful goddess in the world is, right? So Paris, not thinking ahead much, is like, sweet, this sounds great, right? And by the way, they immediately take off all their clothes and they're like, check me out. And he's like, wow, this is the best job ever. Not realizing, of course, it's going to lead to the Trojan War because he listens to these goddesses, he looks at them, he can't make a decision, they're just drop-dead gorgeous, and they start bribing him. So Athena says something like, you're going to be the greatest warrior of all time, you'll be the smartest tactician, I can give you that. And he's like, that sounds great. And then Hera comes along and says, you want to be the greatest leader of all time, the greatest statesman of all time, I can give you that. And he's like, that would be cool too. And then Aphrodite comes along and says, hey, you know what, I've got... I can make any woman you want fall in love with you. Just take your pick. And then, by the way, she conjures up an image of Helen of Troy, the most beautiful woman in the world. One of those figures that was in, remember Leonardo da Vinci's Laid in the Swan, one of those eggs that cracked open, one of those children was Helen, uh, Helen of Troy, as she's known. The problem with this is, and um, of course, Paris is smitten by her, and gives the apple to Aphrodite, is that he makes two enemies in, in this. And then he goes off to collect Helen of Troy. Uh, I don't know if he knew in advance, but she was already married to Menelaus in Greece. He goes and she falls in love with him, probably with the help of Cupid. He steals her away. And the Greeks get together and chase him over to Troy and try to get Helen back, thus resulting in a 10-year Trojan War at least, again, according to Greek mythology. What's being referenced here, though, is the male fantasy part of this, right? Um, what's being referenced here is we've got um, a man who's dressed not like a Trojan, but like a contemporary Burgundian knight, uh, you know, one of these knights from the areas of Germany. And this is probably the class of patron that was buying this. And he's been woken up by Hermes, and basically it's saying something like, are you sick of all the religious wars that are going on? Are you sick of the peasant revolts that are happening everywhere, threatening your land-holding masses? Are you thick, sick, sick, basically, of having to do any work? Wouldn't you prefer to wake up some morning and have three gorgeous women, you know, goddesses, flirting with you, offering you bribes, and so forth, and, of course, the answer is yes. Well, let me paint you that picture. And then people look at this and they're like, what's the deal with these women? They're kind of weird-looking bodies. And I just keep saying to people, the taste uh, and the, the things that men have found beautiful of women over the ages change dramatically from, like, every 20 years all the way through the history of art. And in this part of the world, that is what is deemed very provocative. So let's go on to lecture guide number six, also on the Northern Renaissance. But we're going to move further north, and we're going to go up basically uh, to the Netherlands. I am going to guess that just about everyone in this class at one time or another has seen this work. You've just never seen it closed. This is the outer leaves of Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. When that altarpiece, a triptych, is closed, this is what it actually looks like. It's a scene of, one presumes, the world itself, before humans or animals have populated it, looking, uh, you know, I don't know, as if it's full of a ton of potential and very peaceful. And then you open this scene up, and by the way, I mean, they've just learned that the world, well, they're kind of figuring out that the world is round, that it's a big orb. 
not quite sure what to make of that yet. So we often get pictures like this at this time where you got like a flat world and then some kind of orb shape around it. Like we don't get gravity. I don't understand how this works. Why don't people fall off the bottom? So they don't, they're not quite there yet, uh, but they do these weird composites. When you open it up, you get this. How many people have seen this before somewhere? And there's some pretty excellent, super high def images out there that you can just go around, Google, Google scroll around it, and sit in various areas, and they'll tell you, well, they'll, they'll do their best to tell you what the hell's going on, but honestly, no one knows what the hell's going on here. We don't know. I mean, I've seen a million interpretations of this, and I'm going to give you a couple of them. Um, and the standard, may, I mean, I can tell you the general things that are going on, but when it comes to the specific imagery, there's a lot of confusion. So we'll start with the general. What we're looking at here in a triptych, and remember triptychs tend to be almost always associated with religion, and this one's not, or at least not directly. It, he, he liked this format, and oftentimes he'll use it to poke a little bit of fun at religious practices, and by that I don't mean to say that he's denigrating the church, he'll just poke fun at the way that people act in the world even though they say they're Christian. So off to the left hand side here we have a Garden of Eden scene. I'll show you a close up of this in a minute. With what pre presumptively is a kind of fountain of life over here. And it's populated by all the animals, which by the way people are um, beginning to see more and more of because of the exploration of places like Africa and the Far East and most of the explorations uh, would take artists along who would create little illustrations and those illustrations would be turned into prints. So imagine being in the Netherlands and seeing like elephants and giraffes for the first time. And by the way, in the Garden of Eden, before they went extinct, there were apparently uh, unicorns, you know, so all kinds of things in here. A fantastical landscape, very uh, happy up here. Looks like, you know, Garden of Eden scene. And then we witness basically either the presentation of Eve to Adam by God or a marriage of Adam and Eve here. Uh, it's been interpreted both ways. I don't know why they would need to be married here, but apparently uh, that's one of the interpretations. In any case, they're first kind of greeting each other. And what we see in this, by the way, is if you get up close and you see all these great animals, is right at the moment that man and women are introduced to one another, all hell starts breaking loose down here below. It's as if the, uh, you know, the two sexes together is what leads to all the strife and all the problems and all the sins of mankind. And frankly, that's one part of the Bible, right? They will sin, they will create original sin. And what I mean by that is you've got strange little animals, this is some kind of like platypus type thing, eating frogs. You've got cats running off with mice. You've got birds picking at various things. In other words, you have conflict already. And it's right here in the foreground in this pool. And these pools that you see in multiple places are probably associated with sexual activity. One of the keys to this work that we think kind of makes these images make sense is that a lot of the imagery may be based on old Netherlandish sayings, adages, proverbs, and so forth. And I'm going to ask you about this in a minute. But here the proverb or the saying was, sex is like swimming in the bath of Venus. So when you see pools of water and figures in water, that may be a reference to the idea of sexual activity, again, albeit oblique. And so here, sexual activity or desire is what leads to all the sin that's in the world or is the root cause of all sin in the world. The center scene, which we'll show uh, in a minute, is the Garden of Earthly Delights itself. And the way that I understand this is what you're looking at here is not something that he wants to glorify. What he's saying is, in a very kind of medieval, often pessimistic view of humanity, People know better. They know what's right and they know what's wrong. We've all been here before and yet they're prone to follow their desires regardless of the consequences, right? So we know better. I don't know how many times in my life I've done something that I'm like, I really shouldn't do this. And then it's like, oh, I'm gonna do it anyway. It'll be, it'll be fun, it'll be enjoyable, whatever it is. In this case, what they're doing though is extreme 
sexual activity by the standards of the day that is absolutely deemed something that's going to land you over here, which is hell. And so my general interpretation of this is what Bosch is saying is something like humans are foolish creatures. They know better and they know the consequences of their action and still they're prone to these types of things. We know that this work was first displayed basically in, or the one place we know it was displayed was in basically a hotel in a kind of lobby space before it was collected by the Spanish. And that if it were there in a very public space, what people probably would have done is looked at this very carefully, laughed about what they were seeing, and been like, oh, I recognize that. Yeah, people do do that. They would have looked at some of these scenes that are so weird and imaginative, and they would have tried to, I think, puzzle out what is the symbolism here? What is this all about? What is Bosch trying to say here? What is the Netherlandish proverb that might be at the root of this image? And then over here, Hell is very distinctive, and it had been for a while now. Ever since the time of Dante, a lot of artists had, uh, and some of you know about Dante's Inferno, Dante had really given you a, a much more complex view of hell and what people are punished by, and their punishments in hell are oftentimes associated with what their crimes were or sins were in real life. And so in Bosch's hell, you are punished in eternity by something that is very similar to the sin that you committed in life. And you'll see the specifics of this in a moment. So let's get in close on this. It's basically set up as three zones. In the front of the zone is like rampant sexual activity. In the middle zone are primarily men uh, on the backs of various animals. One seems to be circling this, again, Bath of Venus, where there are beautiful women who are paying them some attention and basically exhorting them to greater and greater levels of um, showing off. There are men on the back of these like doing hand flips and so forth, and I'm sure you've never seen this before, ladies, man trying to show off for you, but there it is, right? And then up above, you've got this weird scene of fountains that we don't really know a ton about. We do know, however, that these types of images of these fountain type shapes almost assuredly has a reference point in Hieronymus Bosch's wife's family business. They were apothecaries, basically early chemists, people that created remedies for people, but also may have practiced what was known um, as alchemy. A lot of people practiced this. Alchemy was the idea of trying to transmute base metals like lead into gold. Of course, it never got anywhere. Um, but it was also associated with spiritual practices. And by the way, one of the big interpretations of this work is that this is all about alchemical practices in which human beings in some kind of cultic religion tried to transmute their base, vulgar level of humanity into the spiritual grace uh, of the higher form associated with gold and so forth. Another interpretation I want to give you, too, that I'd like you to write down, even though I think it's completely bogus, is that what you're actually witnessing here is not a condemnation of this rampant sexual activity, but rather is something that is promoting it. Uh, and that interpretation says that Bosch was somehow a member of this group known as the Adamites, or also known as the Brethren of the Free Spirit, which as far as I can tell is like a prefiguration of 60s free love, in which people practice this state of, you know, free love in the world as if they existed in the Garden of Eden pre-temptation and fall where sex was not a bad thing and there was no kind of downside to it. The problem with that interpretation is first you have to believe that Bosch was a member of this and second the last written um, uh, evidence of this group is about a hundred years before this painting was ever created. And frankly, I, you couldn't possibly display this in public at this time if you're like, brother in this free spirit, here we go, everyone, let's all hook up and, and think that you're not going to be excommunicated or you know, dragged off to be burned at the stake, in my opinion. So what are we actually looking at here? Well, again, um, you, you, you tell me. These are just some close-ups. So I just want you to look at this for a minute. I want you to turn to your neighbors. I want you to 
start with the premise that this is all a conversation piece, that what you're supposed to do is look at this and be like, holy crap, what the hell is that, right? How do I make sense of that? What is that all about? And then searching, and you can't do it, right? We're not Dutch. We don't have all these Netherlandish proverbs under our belt. And by the way, they're hard enough to figure out. Uh, I'd like you to just think, though, about those types of adages or proverbs or sayings that are around the world, knowing that they're mainly based upon actual, rational, logical explanations. So for instance, does anyone have any of these? And what I'm talking about like, is uh, when I was about your age, I had this, uh, had this really great job uh, for the summer working on a road crew with these two other really old dudes. We didn't do like more than 10 minutes worth of work the entire summer, and I did it all. Like They just traveled around places eating sandwiches and making fun of me. And they'd just make me go off to do whatever, and they'd say, ah, just send the kid out there. He can do it. And the other guy would say, he can't do it. He doesn't know his ass from his elbow or something. And I'd be like, yeah, that's it. I've got to write that one down. And then they'd be like, yeah, the kid's dumber in a box of rocks or whatever. You know, and I'm like, D -d I'm dumber in a box of rocks. I've got to write that one down, too. These are good ones, right? Some of these have bases. So for instance, how many people have heard, and I'm not saying that you throw this around at parties, like, hey, I've got one. Uh, but <laughs> this is, a, uh, you know, that so-and-so is three sheets to the wind. Have, have you ever heard that before? Anyone know what that means? Yeah, you're trash, you're drunk, right? Why? Yeah. Yeah, it has to do with sailing, exactly. So three sheets, the sheets are your sails. And if you put up all of your sails to the windward side, your t boat's going to tip over, just like some of us tip over if you had a little bit too much to drink, right? So there is an explanation behind these things. And I use that one because there are other works by Bosch in which you'll see a boat up, and it's got three sails up, and the whole boat's tipping over, and there's a bunch of yokels in there like drinking, and you're like, that's exactly what this is. But imagine you're trying to interpret this work and you don't know any of the sayings in the first place and you're like, huh, I don't know what that saying could be, right? It makes it really hard for us. <laughs> so what do you see here? Just turn to your neighbor, share your thoughts, try to come up with an explanation, have some fun. So I, I really do hesitate to ask, but does anyone, uh, does anyone have something they want to put out there as a possible interpretation? Kind of like I dare you. Yeah. Well, I doubt this is right, but on the left with the birds, it makes me think of the birds of paradise that are all about showing off in these very elaborate mating displays. No, I don't think you're far off. One of the big interpretations of all the birds that are in here, 
uh, has to do with the phallic nature of their beaks and the idea that there's a number of, I know people are like, ah, Freud again. No, it's well before Freud, but there were a bunch of sayings that were about uh, birds pecking at fruit being like sexual acts. So you can imagine, I mean, I don't want to act it out, but I'm sure you get it, like peck, peck, peck. Yeah, so there, that's in there. So when you see these incredibly long beaks, probably thinking sexual activity there. How about this? So that is for these people's time, and sadly, I think um, this, you know, is part of our our troubled history. In the United States, of course, there were laws in place into the 60s about mixing of races, mixed couples. And so when you see this, you shouldn't think, oh, yay, it's a big nod to, um, you know, acceptance of mixed race couples. What they would have been thinking is this is abnormal. This is animalistic. This is what they called miscegenation, the mixing of the races and its unnatural acts. You also see things like this a lot. So, I may, well, we haven't gotten there yet. Owls are associated with knowledge, but they're also nocturnal creatures. And so, oftentimes, they will be associated with knowledge of dark things, like things of the night. And that can mean sex, or it can mean evil. When light's not around, which is associated with God, bad things happen. And so, you see this thing embracing maybe dark knowledge. This is really common here. You see a ton of these and a ton of fruit, people eating fruit. And they both seem to be based upon some of the same sayings, which go like this. When you see people in the bubble, what they're saying is that the sexual act or the desire that goes along with sex is transient. It lasts only a bit, and then the bubble bursts. And then, of course, you know, you're like, what the hell did I do? The same thing with fruit. There were at least three sayings about the taste, uh, the associated sex and its transience, the transience of desire with the taste of strawberries or raspberries on the tongue that is fleeting. And so what it's basically saying there is, and I'm sure everyone's been somewhere near this before, where you get caught up in something, you're like gung-ho about it, and then afterwards you're like, what the hell was I thinking? Here it associates it with sex. This up here... I have no idea, right? I, what the hell's going on there? No clue. Someone's uh, doing a handstand underwater, or rather a headstand underwater with some kind of fruit on his junk, and there's birds popping out of it, and it's like, I don't know what that statement could have been ever. <laughs> there's also a ton of things in here that show men and men um, and again, homosexuality was deemed to be a sin, uh, and so you shouldn't be thinking that that's like a big nod towards acceptance of homosexuality. You've got a whole host of things that are uh, oftentimes about masturbation, which was seen as a sin, like this guy's munching his own strawberry, so I'm pretty sure that's about <laughs> masturbation. Again, I don't know what's up with Bob over here. Um, and then you've got, you know, birds feeding fruits to people, lots of sexual activity and so forth. This is a homosexual kind of reference, right? So a profusion of this, but the joy, I think, or the, the fun of this was looking at this really, and there, it's almost unprecedented imagery and trying to kind of tease out what the meanings of this were and also saying things like, oh yeah, people are like that a little bit. There are sources to some of this, and those sources are actually medieval marginalia. So if you take a class 202 or you take an upper division class on medieval arts, you know that a lot of illuminated manuscripts have these beautiful passages taken from the Bible, beautiful imagery in the main page, but off on the margins it has the world's weirdest imagery you've ever seen, oftentimes little devils crawling up the sides of the pages, weird things in England, they have all of these snails jousting uh, one another, and you're like, what the hell is that all about? Um, it's it, again, it's probably meant to say that if you don't stay the, the narrow path here with God, all of these other creepy qualities uh, show up, and he may have drawn from that as well. Up in this higher scene, again, the women uh, kind of showing off for the men, uh, and the men, and by the way, they have like apples on their heads and so forth, and the men doing somersaults and cartwheels and trying to show off back for them as well. 
The scene of hell, I'm just going to focus on this because we could be here all week, is again associated with um, various sayings, like this one with the knife between the ears actually has to do with anger. Up here at the very top register, you have an apocalyptic scene. Here in the middle register, you have all of these things that are about kind of the generic qualities that lead to hell. And then down here in the foreground, you have a lot of specific imagery associated with various sins that will land you in hell. And as I said before, the trick to this is all that what you do in life that is your sin is going to be revisited on you in a horrible way in hell for all eternity. So over here, for instance, all of this has to do with games of chance and gambling. And the problem with games of chance, and it can be things like backgammon or it can be cards, is that chance is the, the, um, is the purview of the devil. God's all about order. Anything that invokes chance in, and chaos is the realm of the devil. So gambling's bad not just because you can lose all your money. Gambling's really bad because you are playing a game that is ruled by the devil. And so here you see people who are you know, having their hands stabbed through, arms cut off, and so forth. And you see this in particular. And this absolutely comes from medieval marginalia. You can see this all over the place. It's a rabbit who's got a hunter's horn blowing in its mouth, and it's carrying as its quarry or its prey this woman. What is this? This is the inversion of the natural order. The hunted becomes the hunter, right? And that's saying this is inverting the natural order of God by using chance rather than order. In this scene, you see another reference to homosexuality. Remember when I said flutes and blown instruments are associated with vulgar sex, just sex for sex sake, for pleasure oftentimes. That's not how you're supposed to play that flute, I'm pretty sure. And so that is associated with homosexuality. Over here, <coughs> excuse me, gluttony. So overeating, what happens to you? Well, you get eaten by this you know, bird-headed devil. Uh, with a cauldron on his head, which is, again, uh, symbolic of anger. Um, and then you get crapped out into a cesspool for all eternity. This person's defecating, this person's vomiting, right? Not something probably you want happening even once, let it alone for all eternity. Over here, if your sin is vanity, taking too much pleasure in your looks, you get to look at yourself in the ass end of a devil for all of eternity. Over here, a little lesser known sin known as attrition. Attrition is professing a love for God, but only in want of reward or because you're fearful of the consequences. It's not a true love of God. It's a false love. And here you see that false love is revisited upon him with the head uh, of a pig, seeming to be that of an, a, a religious figure, a nun. One more Bosch for you. Uh, he did a ton, and I honestly, there, there's some really interesting work done on Bosch, but I wanted to show you one that's closer to home. The last one you saw was in the Prado in Madrid. This one is in DC. This is the death of the miser, and this is very typical Hieronymus Bosch, and it's one of the reasons that we think the last work is kind of a pessimistic view of mankind and really poking fun at the fact of humans, uh, you know, foolish nature. He went at that subject over and over again. He's a, he, most of his works are moralizing works. So the miser here, as it's called, it may not have been called the death of a miser. This guy is just someone who really, really likes money more than anything else, is what it's getting at. And it's what's known as a simultaneous narrative. So you see two moments in this man's life. He's on his deathbed here, and this is him sometime earlier in life. What he's doing earlier in life is that he's putting gold coins into a chest at the bottom of his bed that is filled with objects, and there are more objects around here, that clearly have been pawned. These are things that someone would have taken to him, things like armor, silverware, jewelry. Um, and when they're in a lurch, they go to this man, and they give it to him, and he gives them very little money in return, supposedly holds this for them, but we know how pawn shops work. This is illegal at the time. This is usury, right? This is not something that is acceptable, and that's why this chest is clandestinely at the foot of his bed rather than somewhere public. 
So he is all about the money, and he's doing horrible things, and you see who his cohort are. They're all these little creepy devils that are all over the place, by the way. That's what he's cultivated in his life. And on his deathbed, what occurs is that his guardian angel shows up and says, hey, see Christ, Sac he sacrificed for you, right? Repent your sins truly, and you can be saved. And yet, because his whole life has been about money, all he's interested in is more money, right? Let's move on to someone who was a little bit younger than Bosch, but um, certainly took some of his ideas to heart. He even practiced in the same way for some of his career. This is a work that's called The Triumph of Death. You don't need to remember this. I just wanted you to see, you know, very, very Bosch-like end of day scene with lots of little uh, imagery in here that's associated with Netherlandish proverbs. The one I want to focus on a couple of these is this one. This one's usually titled The Fall of Icarus, although very little of this has to do with that Greek myth, and I think that's the main point, and that's, that's why I'm spending some time with this. I said before that up in the north, they tended to have far less interest in classical ideas, or at least you know, it doesn't show up as frequently in their art as it does in Italy, and this is a pretty good um, example of that. Icarus is a really famous uh, myth in, in, you know, for the Greeks. Uh, Icarus and Daedalus are father and son. Daedalus is the, the father. And um, Daedalus is actually imprisoned on an island. He's a great inventor. And with his son, he fashions wings made out of the feathers of the birds on the island and wax from the bees' hides on the island. And he does something that's been you know, a major human aspiration forever, and that's fly so that they could escape from the island, right? So it's all about aspiration. Some of you probably know this. The Greek myths are all proverbs. They're all meant to teach you something about what you are supposed to do and what you're supposed to look out for. The proverb in this one is all about hubris, excessive pride. Here's this man who has accomplished something that no one else has accomplished in order to save himself and his son. He's taught man how to fly. And as they leave the island, Daedalus says to his young son, son, don't fly too high. Don't fly too high. And, you know, this is bogus, but the way that they thought of it at the time was you fly too high, you get closer to the sun, it gets hotter, the wax will melt, and you'll die. It actually gets colder, of course, but the parable is correct. Don't fly too high means don't exceed, uh, you know, your limitations. Don't have excessive pride or hubris. Now, Icarus gets caught up in the moment, and he keeps flying higher and higher because it's so fun, and eventually, you know, those wings melt, he crashes to his death. Proverb uh, is uh, achieved. This one, though, what do you see primarily? You see a beautiful harbor, right, and boats. This is the age, uh, almost the Dutch golden age. Not quite there yet, but coming up on it, where the Dutch are out trading and exploring and building what becomes a major republic for a while. And there it is, right? There's all that beauty. This is what the landscape looks like, all of that detail. And then it shows basically a genre scene. Genre is a little bit of a tricky word in art history because it can mean two things. Genre in general means ordinary subject matter, right? So if someone says that's a genre scene, what they mean is you're looking at a scene of ordinary folk, nothing special, not some biblical tale, not some you know, a religious scene, not a king, just ordinary folk. But genre can also be used to say a certain type of painting. So we could say the genre of the female nude, the genre of the male nude, the genre of history painting, the genre of religious painting, the genre of landscape painting. In this case, genre means everyday folk, a farmer tilling his field, uh, you know, a shepherd down here tending his flock, and in here, you can probably barely see it, is a little skull. The proverb that this painting is really all about is it says, uh, it comes from a proverb that says, the plow stops for the death of no man. And all that means is, being practical, we can pay our respects to someone who's died, but the work has to get done, you have to go about your business. Now, hidden almost over here are the legs that give this work its title. That's Icarus, who's fallen into the sea. No one's even noticed. And it's as if 
this Dutch artist is saying something like, yeah, we know about the Greeks. We know about their proverbs and everything. We don't care so much about that. We've got our own proverbs. I'm going to turn this one over to you so I can take a little bit of, uh, of a breath, and I think you can make sense of this a little bit. This is called the raising of the cross, and I'm going to give you the premise of this. You're seeing a scene, remember I always said in the North, they oftentimes will set a religious subject in a contemporary setting or make something very relatable. In this case, think of it this way. He's saying something like, um, imagine the crucifixion happens right now. How would people respond? Right? So that's your first question. How does this work reference how people will respond during um, Bruegel's own age? The second question I have for you is, what are all the characteristics of this that make you immediately sure this could not be an Italian Renaissance painting and would have to be something more northern? Turn to your neighbors and share your thoughts. You having a tough time finding Jesus? So that's your first indicator that it's like, this couldn't be Italian Renaissance. There he is right there. There's the cross, right? But he blends into this whole scene, doesn't he? He's right in the middle, but it's hard to find him. He's fallen down for a moment. Then we just see people milling all over the place, don't you? And the way that this works really is unlike a Renaissance work that says, hey, look here first, look there second, look there third is it guides you through this. These people in red are all the soldiers, and I, this slide's a little bit orangey anyway for some reason. But we're going through this path when it leads us up here, right? And along the way, we just kind of see little anecdotal scenes. What's going on there? What's this guy doing? Nothing really unifies everything. Or it doesn't unify it in the same obvious way that you get in the Italian Renaissance. It's, little, it's like life, right? If I were to say, what is the meaning of this room, you'd say, I don't even know what that question means, right? What could that possibly mean? Something unifies th this room. We're all here for an art history course, but beyond that, it's pretty disparate. If I sit down with one group, they're going to be talking about things differently than others. And that's how this works, right? What are these people doing? What are these people doing? What are these people doing? Well, what we notice is that no one's really paying a ton of attention to Christ here. If there is any one big impetus, it seems to be to get a good seat at the crucifixion. Right? They're already there waiting. And remember, during his time, and if you've seen a period movie, you know this, people tend to be pretty um, uh, interested in the spectacle of executions. And he's saying, there they go. They're not being religious. They're not trying to save him. They're more interested in the spectacle of seeing someone die who has claimed himself to be the Messiah on earth. In fact, the only people who really act properly are right here in the foreground. And that's the religious family. You've got Mary Magdalene, you've got Mary the Virgin, you've got John the Evangelist, and one of the other kind of nondescript Marys here, acting appropriately. The final thing about this that I want you to know is this strange shape here, which is also in these works as well, those are what are known as wheels of death, actually made out of wagon wheels. They're associated with some of the treatment uh, to people in this part of the world by the Habsburgs who were controlling Spain and were often up here in the north taking over parts of uh, Holland where people were actually tied to these wheels, put on 
young saplings that are kind of springy and allowed to just sit up there in the sky until they weathered to death. And then their bones would be picked apart by various carrion. In other words, a modern form of crucifixion. There is even some evidence to suggest people would be tied to these wheels and rolled to the plot, spot of their crucifixion, banging their head against the ground, breaking their wrists and ankles. And no one stopped this, right? It's still, you know, a form that's practiced even in his own world. He's also famous for things like this, very genre scenes. I'm not going to spend any time on this. This is one of four paintings on the seasons called Hunters in the Snow or the Return of the Hunters. It's about winter. Um, the idea of seasonal paintings is based upon books of hours, which are basically little illuminated books uh, that will be keyed into the calendar and various religious observances and passages in the Bible associated with those times of year. Um, in this case, what you really need to know is in this part of the world, and particular with, particularly with Bruegel, you get something you haven't seen before, which are everyday kind of genre scenes. This is what this part of the world looked like, right? He's not necessarily trying to idealize it. He's certainly tinkering with it a little bit so that you get a particular view, but what do people do in the winter in Holland? Well, they go hunting. There they are with their hounds, right? This is what they wear. They ice skate. This is what their homes look like. This is what that world generally looks like. He does his own form of parables, just like Bosch. This is called, uh, uh, you know, the blind, leading the blind. It's a passage from the Bible. So the passage in the Bible says, the blind, if the blind shall lead the blind, they shall fall into a ditch. It's about spiritual blindness in the Bible. Uh, remember, we're in a Protestant part of the world, and they're still worried about the Catholics leading people the wrong way and different types of spiritual practices leading people the wrong way. What I really wanted to, so you see the church in the background, what I really wanted to point to here, though, is that his naturalism, his naturalism in this work extends to the way that he depicts blindness. He just doesn't randomly depict people like without eyes or with, uh, you know, some kind of glazed eye or whatever. There are at least four different types of blindness shown here, from glaucoma to cataracts to people born congenitally without eyes to people that um, have had some kind of, you know, um, physical uh, injury to their eyes, very clearly depicted in each case. One of the works I really want you to know something about is this one. So this is The Peasant Wedding by Bruegel still. And when I was first taking art history classes, art historians used to just talk about this as a, a genre painting. Like, wow, isn't this cool? You get to see what a peasant wedding really looks like. Um, an artist who is actually interested in the lower classes of people. And I remember sitting there and thinking, yeah, but who's buying this, right? Why would anyone want a picture of the peasant classes if this is, you know, if these people are seen as vulgar and beneath them and so forth? And then people, I think art historians, started really looking at these and realizing that in addition to showing you the practices of the lower classes here, there's also something that's very common in the North and frankly around the world that is um, saying basically the reason that these people are the way they are, the reason that they're not completely out of control has to do with the fact that there is a middle class that are um, controlling them, that are ordering their existence. Or another way to put this is to say that people with money need to give these people some kind of structure in their life because left to their own devices, they'll run rampant and do stupid, very vulgar things and kind of lead humanity in the wrong direction. And that's in just about every one of these types of genre scenes. And what I mean by that is this is the man over here, the rich landowner who has loaned out this space so that these peasants can have their wedding. And he looks very, very calm. He's very well dressed, but he's also someone who looks like he's very mannered, right? He's doing everything right. While these peasants are shown more or less kind of yokelish, not very bright, 
um, certainly very homely, but also doing things that are associated with indulgence. The big one being in the foreground, the first thing you see are, um, you know, basically alcohol, tons and tons of alcohol. And by the way, no one's guarding this little kid who's right by all the alcohol. And I'm not going to ask you, but the first time I got drunk, where my parents were like, holy crap, what just happened, was at a wedding where no one was paying attention. I'm like, oh, you're just going to try a little bit of this and a little bit of that, right? And there that is. This is wedding pudding, basically. It's something that the peasants would eat with their hands, and it's got a whole ton of sexual innuendo to it, and they are scarfing it down everywhere. Over here is the bride herself, prominently displayed with her crown for the day and the green blanket on the background, which is a symbol of fertility, the wedding blanket. Um, but she's so tired here, she's kind of falling asleep, and the husband, by the way, is nowhere to be found. Then there are these symbols of things that are, again, symbols of sexual activity. Yes, they played bagpipes there, but if you start looking around, you're going to see a lot of extravagant cod pieces as well, and so it's all about, uh, again, the indulgences of these people and, and, you know, saying, if we just left them to their own devices, this would, uh, you know, lead culture the wrong way. So we need people like that. And these are the people that were probably probably the patrons for Bruegel's paintings like this. They like these scenes of look at how, I, how, how fun these people are, and again, I need to be here to, to, to help them out. Does anyone have any questions?